This lowers the bar and all you have to do is just get in motion, just step. The conditions don't have to be perfect. So I'm sitting in my studio here, (laughs) freezing cold. The building we're in is not heated. So when you're here at night, it gets pretty cold and you end up wearing your coat. (laughs) Anyway, what I wanted to talk about today was about why we make it so hard why we make it so hard in our art and just sort of explore this a little bit. I think this might be helpful to make things easier. I thought I would start out today with the premise because this connects to why it is hard for us that there's a lot of limiting beliefs around what's possible for ourselves and the cry of that art making is available to anyone is really at the core of everything I teach and everything we're doing it art to life that no matter what level you are or what your experience is or anything that anyone is an artist who wants to be this is for anybody everyone's eligible and i know this for certain because i've spent most of my life working with people and i think that's pretty great so what i'm sharing with you today is going to be helpful no matter what level you're at even if you're just considering making art welcome to art to life a podcast for the creatively curious my name is nicholas wilton and each week i'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life but the art in your life join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight the wild frontiers of art making and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. The other idea is that art making is kind of a way to figure out yourself. (laughs) It's a way to explore who you are and who you're becoming. And when you spend time doing that, not only do you improve, but your art does as well. So it's kind of this long view of of art making and and a more integrated idea of art making that is not so much about the result, although this is the key to the result, is having a practice and being able to do it more and more and more and making it easy to start. But it's this idea that it's a way to figure you out. And I kind of want to go into that today on on this conversation around this. So things that get in our way, they're pretty obvious. I think most people, the things that get in our way are time and not having enough time to do this. There's so many things around art making that relate to running for me, because for many years, I, I, if I didn't have a full hour, I wouldn't even go or an hour and a half because I was so I just thought that if I only could go for an hour or 30 minutes, it wouldn't be worth it. But what I've learned over the years is that what happens is because you disqualify yourself because it's not exactly the right amount of time or these qualifications you set up, these standards you set up for yourself, you skip. And when you skip, you break the pattern. And when you break the pattern, anything can break the pattern. And the less you do, the less you do. And it's this sort of cycle. So that relates to time a little bit and to not be so hard on yourself. If you only have a little bit of time, the most important thing that I want to share with you around this time issue is that it it takes so little to actually make the, to make art and to participate in it. Literally five or 10 minutes is huge compared to not doing it at all. And I'll, I'll kind of explain why, why that is. So right here, right now, we've just reduced the barrier for doing this, this art thing, you can participate in it for like 20 minutes and and the, the benefits are gigantic. And also this relates, the thing that gets in our way also is just that I'm not good enough, you know, and it's crazy because if, when you reframe art making in terms of this idea that you're just figuring yourself out, you're just, that's what it is. That's what you're doing. And so it's really important to just begin to just do this. That's, it's actually an exploration. The whole thing's an exploration. Saying you're not good enough to ask a question or be curious is kind of ludicrous, right? You know, it's like the the I'm not good enough comes from looking at someone else's outcome, usually some 
amazing work of art and saying I could never be that good or I would my things could never be like that. And so why bother trying? Right. So this reframe really, really helps. The other one is that I don't have a place. I don't have a good enough studio. And I use this one for, I think, 10 years, <laughs> just so you know. And I still don't have a good enough studio. It's gotten better and better. But oh, my God, this is crazy to wait for the place, to wait for the conditions, to rob yourself of what's possible to be involved in this, to figure yourself out because you don't have the right place. And you probably don't even know what the right place is. All of these ideas kind of drop away when you begin, when you're making art. There's a big difference between thinking about making art and the magic that happens when you start and getting in motion. So the conditions, and this is kind of a truth, you know, that I've seen that the conditions for beginning become greater and greater the longer you postpone, right? The bigger the absence, the harder it is to get back to it. This is just a bad cycle that keeps on going and going and going, right? You know, it's like you go away for two weeks and then it's like, well, I've gone, been gone for two weeks. Why don't I just stay away for, you know, who cares? Like another week, what difference is it going to make? And then a month goes by and then you're, you're so disconnected from it. So it's like the less you do, the less you do. Right. But here's the thing the the secret to this, the, the piece that we have to remember is that everything changes when we get in motion. The thing that's so cool about art is that the payoff is immediate. If you're thinking about it the right way, if you're not thinking about it, like I have to make a thing that looks amazing and we start focusing on what's happening to you and emotionally and, and your progress, then it's problematic. But this idea that we can have a really positive experience, have an experience that's so different in your day is really, really valuable, regardless of whether you're a beginner or not. It doesn't matter. Everyone is eligible and everyone can have this extraordinary experience of, of making something. You know, it's just, it's the coolest thing. And once you start, and this is, this is where the magic happens, you know, you just need a couple of minutes. And so what is that? Like, what is happening when we start, you know? And I've, I've thought a lot about this and there's a lot of mystery to it. There's a lot of serendipity to it. There's all kinds of things. But I think what happens is when you start back in and you're just, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you've got that paintbrush, you've got that pen and you're doing the thing. I think connections start happening for you. You, at least for me, this is what I see. I do this little daily practice of anything, just a five minute thing. And it connects me to what I did recently. There's something when I'm doing it, it connects back to what I recently did. There's a, like, there's a way to remember and you start making connections between what you did before and things that are exciting in the future. There's just this little kind of magical thing that happens because you're making something. Ideas start to happen. You just kind of get in a little bit of a flow. You, you get connected to something more than just the thing you're working on. It's actually a sequence. It's a pattern that you drop back into. And that's the pattern that we want to stay in. We want to stay involved in that. And it's so easy to get back into it. Literally, it's like just five minutes. We don't even have to have a plan. <laughs> you know, we can just start. And it's not logical. And this is the part that I think is challenging for people because we try to figure this out using normal life situations or things that apply to life. Like if you want to build a house, you got to do the foundation and you get the permit and do the drawings and get the foundation. And then there's this whole sequence of things. And, and it's true. That's, that that's a logical way. There's a logical way to do things, but this thing of getting connected back to your art and finding your way in it isn't 
really logical. I don't think it's logical or doesn't need to be logical. And the more free you can be and the sort of trusting you can be, the cooler the thing can become. You know, it's really interesting because I remember getting into writing early on when, you know, about 10 or 15 years ago when things in my life had gone really upside down and it was just, there wasn't a lot of positive things happening. And I remember just literally thinking, I got to write or do something to talk about this time. So I have something when I get through this, hopefully that I'll have done something, I'll have made something that this time it was so horrendous, but I'll have this thing. Like, at least I can say, you know, when I was in that dark period, I did X, you know, and I thought that I could do this book. I thought I could do these stories or start a blog, you know, or something had to come out of it. It was just, I needed to make something. And it was kind of intuitive, you know, I, it just felt like a nice solution to how I was feeling that this would make sense. And I, I don't know why, Exactly. It just intuitively felt like something I could do. And so I joined this writing group and it was totally unlikely. I mean, I'd never done anything like this before. And we would write a thing and I, I thought, well, I'm going to write about art. I was learning a lot and I thought maybe if I write about it, it'll help clarify for myself because I was trying to do fine art at the time. And then I would read, these people weren't artists. They they were different from different walks of life and they all had cool books. There was like 10 of us, all different kinds of books that they were working on. And I, you know, I said, I'm, I don't know if this is a book. I'm just like learning how to I'm just here, you know, but you would read your stories and I would read about me making art, which wasn't that interesting. But then at the end they would say, yeah, but what was the, I would try to have to explain like how in art, when you take away, when you have too much of something, that's what it was. When you have too much of something, how important it is in art to pay attention to that. And it can be really redundant and it can feel too much. And there's an opportunity in art, especially painting, how I was thinking about it, to get rid of the thing. And that the very thing that you've put in there, because you love it so much, if you have too much of it, it tends to lose its power. It's weird. It's, it's not like more of something necessarily makes it better. That was the idea. And I was literally telling this to them, like I'm telling it to you now, which isn't that interesting. But they said, well, what do you like? What do you mean? And I, I told the story and I'll give you a little taste of what that was. It was the story I told was of visiting my father who had remarried and he lived at the time in Ashland, Oregon. And I would see him maybe once or twice a year. And uh, I went to see him and I remember getting there and they had this you know, my dad was from England and he had, you know, he wasn't very sentimental. Like we, and we never could have pets. That was a thing. Like he would say no pets in this house. And so I had, I mean, I did have fish, you know, my sister had a parrot, but I never had a dog, you know, and I never had a cat and I borrowed neighbors, but you know, my, he wasn't into it, you know, neither of my parents were, which is a bummer. But anyway, when he remarried, he ended up moving to Ashland, Oregon, and they got really into cats. And I knew they had a couple cats, but when I got there, I didn't realize that they had so many cats. They had like 10 cats. And I think they were involved in, in sort of rescue, like rescuing kittens and cats. So that was, it was kind of like a orphanage for these cats, you know, and I'll never forget it. Cause I opened the door, you know, and my dad's there and, but the smell, <laughs> you know, like when you live in a house with a lot of cat litter. I mean, it's just, there's just this fragrance of cats and it was really strong. I remember hugging my dad. I was just kind of bowled over with this smell of cats, you know, and then they had constructed this crazy thing on the, on, on the side of their kitchen. That it was this tree that led up to these shelves that were really high up along the ceiling that were built for the cats to walk around on. You know, I just, I couldn't believe this. My dad had gotten so into this, you know, he was really creative, you know, he'd really gotten into cats. So these cats, one in particular would climb up this little, it was like a driftwood tree. And then they could hop on these higher, there's like highways of these shelves that they could cruise around right up next to the ceiling. And they loved, it. they sat up there and they moved around. And this was, really great. And I remember staying that night and I brought my bags in and they said, listen, you can't, you have to put your bags 
here and only here. And what it was, was a a blanket, but it had a, a little electrical line going through it with a little charge. So because I guess, and I didn't know this, but anything new that came into the house was really interesting to these cats. And they would come along and they would pee on it, you know, and get into the thing. And I had my bag and my backpack and stuff. So I had to put it in this kind of this blanket area with this electrical thing running around it, you know, and anything. And they were right there, you know, but they wouldn't cross the blanket, you know, they went on the bed, they went by my shoes, you know, and there was a a lot of them, you know, and it was just, it was just so much cats and they had all these cat signs and like funny things about cats. You know, it was like, oh my God, I can't believe that I never even got a cat, you know, and he had all these cats. And then I'm laying there trying to sleep and turns out cats are nocturnal. Like they come alive at night, right? You know, and they were running across the carpet and, you know, I didn't sleep at all. And I was like, oh, maybe I need to go to my car and sleep, but then my dad will be offended. And, you know, this whole thing. <laughs> so, I, But I remember talking to my dad, I'm like, dad, what, what happened? You know, like <laughs> you were like, you were such a this way. And, you know, so it was really funny, but that was the story that I told of like, cats are so awesome, right? They sit on your lap, but, but if you have so many, it's a different experience altogether. And that was the story I told, you know, that's the short version, but I went into this long story of all the details and, and they loved it. You know, everyone in in the the room loved these stories. It was so hilarious, you know, and that got me interested in the power of story. And I think of stories, that's how I learn. And I'm always writing them down. I'm thinking about them. And I teach this way. This is how I teach, you know, in workshops. And I'm always using story because to me, I remember them and and we can apply it to our own life. But this example of I, there was no plan to this, like there was no book that was laid out. It was just of something I was learning as I went. And this podcast, for example, is, is the same way. Like it doesn't have to be logical how you drop back in. You just have to get involved in something, which I think lowers the bar a lot. Like I'm really averse. I, I don't like trying to plan a really grand thing. I get nervous. I like to just start and do something. And this podcast was, that's how I started it. If you listen to the very first episode, I'm like, I don't know exactly (laughs) where I'm going, but I'm going to figure this out and I'm still figuring it out. And it's a really cool process from learning from what people say and the power of story and cool interviews or not cool interviews or what if you say, you know, too much, it bugs people, all the things. And so anyway, but this lowers the bar and all you have to do is just get in motion, just step. The conditions don't have to be perfect. There was this interview with Hemingway that I love this. No, actually it was E.B. White, the author of Charlotte's Web, who, oh my God, I love. He reads Charlotte's Web. If you ever get the audio book for that, he reads it. It is so good. I'll put a link in the show notes for this cassette. I listen to it every year around Christmas. It's just so good. I just heard it again. But he was quoted as saying, they were talking about, he was being interviewed about like how he writes and how he does this whole thing. And he was saying, the members of my household never pay the slightest attention to my being a writing man. They make all the noise and fuss they want to. If I get sick of it, I have places I can go. A writer who waits for ideal conditions under which to work will die without putting a word on paper. You know, it's so good. It's like, that's so true. I mean, I never got the amazing studio and maybe it's coming or maybe not, but I got the art and I'm so into it. And that came because I didn't wait There's another one here from Barbara Kingslaver. She says, I have to write hundreds of pages before I get to page one. And, you know, if you try to write page one, if you think that you have to go back into your practice or you think there's any connection to having to do something as hard as page one, you will just stay away from it. I'd like to think of this practice, this little thing that you drop into as more of a way of saying yes, as more of a way, like a reminder to being open to something. 
that's what we're doing because you don't know what it's going to be. And there's a the little bit of faith here and a little bit of hopefulness that you're going to do something cool and you don't know, and you've been doing this and you have to kind of step back into it and saying yes to that. And also being open to what might happen on the page is a great way to be, you know, it's like just saying yes to the thing. I had this crazy thing that happened today, a jury duty, right? I have been avoiding jury duty for years. And originally there were reasons, legitimate reasons, you know, I had to pick up my daughters, you know, but gradually as I got, you know, I didn't have kids that I had to look after and, you know, the responsibilities were less and my mom passed and I don't have to look after her because that was a reason, you know. And so finally it comes, you know, the summons and they call me and I have to go. And this was today, actually. And I'm thinking of every reason why I can't go because, I mean, COVID and I think I have a sore throat coming on, you know, all the reasons. But there wasn't really a good one. And it was like, I need I need I just I should do this. This is crazy. You know, I always say, no, I'm going to go. And I just said yes to it. And I just kind of like it doesn't make sense. It's the most, you know, I, I just need to do this. This is what we're supposed to do. I'm going to do it, you know, and. I'm going there and I'm today and I'm parking at the Civic Center and on the radio and I wrote it down today, they start talking the conversation. I was listening to the radio lab. That's like a podcast that I sometimes listen to. And it was the whole episode was about jury duty and people's experience with it. And the, the guys are talking about this as I'm getting out of the car and he's saying, yeah, you know, I avoided it, but I'll tell you, you know, What's cool about it is that like it's it exposes you to this whole different way of life. Like it's something you just won't believe like you're going to come. And it reminded me of doing my art yesterday. There's this thing that when you say yes to things, other things connect, you know, and I just let go to this jury duty thing. And I said, yes. And then these guys literally come on the radio at the same instance as I'm parking the car to do this jury duty. And they're talking about the positive aspects of this. And yes, you know, it's your civic duty. And of course, all of that. But it's also about, it's for yourself, you know, it's like to show up and to be part of a community. And we are part of a community and, and that you're going to learn something, you know, like whoever thinks about like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to learn a thing because it's so totally different than what you normally do. And I just let go, you know, and I was thinking about like, well, this is just art. I'm just going to trust what happens. I'm just going to say yes to this. And I'm just going to go, I'm going to get in line and I'm going to, I'm possibly going to be here for a week. And I got, my daughter was coming out for the holidays and this could royally wreck everything, but I just said, yes. Anyway, so this happened this morning and I go and I get in line and I was a little late. And anyway, I'm waiting in line when I almost get up to the window and this woman comes up and there's about 50 people already there. And there's about 20 people behind me, about 15 people behind me. And she goes up to the person right in front of me and she says, okay, you guys, everyone from this person, and the, this is the person in front of me and everyone at the back, follow me. And it's like, oh God, we're going to be taken to some special, you know, this is the people that are going to be here for three weeks, you know, but she takes us outside and she says, listen, you're all excused. I just want to really thank you <laughs> for showing up, you know, because this is a, most people don't and they make excuses. And she was really like, God, this is awesome, but we have everyone we need. And she excused us and happy holidays. And it was amazing, you know, but this is the thing, you know, when you're saying yes to things, it's the same thing in your life. When you start participating in things, other things connect to it. And so saying yes, and that's what we're learning in our art. That's what, what we're doing. It's just the place where we can practice it. I was thinking about what I wanted my year to feel like next year, how this year is going to go and what's coming next. And, you know, as the new year starts to like come upon us, it's just really a great thing to start thinking, you know, how you can do this differently. And I know when you start thinking about it, in anything, when you say yes to anything, then other things happen. And that's just, that's the principle. Just saying yes, just stepping into your art a little bit is the practice that makes other things happen. 
So this is two days ago. So my approach, my whole thing for next year, my work, the word and the feeling of what I want is ease. And I've never really said that before. It's always something different, you know, but that's just, God, I just want that so much. And maybe it's because of COVID and all the things that have happened, you know, but I want it to feel even easier and just spacious and ease was the word, you know. Anyway, uh, I ended up pulling a tarot card recently and the card, I can't remember the card exactly, but I took a picture of of what I read and, and it had a flamingo on it. I think it was like the two of cups. I can't totally remember, but I took a picture of it and what it said on the card, well, there was a bunch of stuff, but the thing that was in bold, it said, when I pay attention to the voice within, I know what boundaries I need to create in order to be at ease. And I mean, that was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I took a picture of this thing and I'd like, I have looked at that like 20 times. It's so true, right? Like the boundaries, you need to create the boundaries to create the ease. And there was just a whole lot of learning in this, in that one sentence, but it came from saying yes. It came from moving into and saying more about my work. And this is where the energy comes from. It's participating in it. It's stepping into it just a little bit, just a tiny little, little, little bit, five minutes a day, you know? So that big takeaway, you know, the big idea here is that this practice, yes, it's called art, but it makes you better. It makes you more open. It makes you more receptive. It makes you the kind of person that can say yes to something and what else. And I just think that is, that's the whole point. It just grows us in a way. And it makes, as we grow like this, it makes our art stronger and stronger and stronger. So why don't we want to be in that space just a little bit? So let go of the the idea that you've got to make page number one. You don't. Page number one is going to come after doing 100 pages, 200 pages. It doesn't matter. The process of participating in this thing called your art is what is important, is what is so meaningful over time and leads to bigger and better and cooler stuff that just creates unbelievable momentum. Anyway, so I just, I hope that was helpful. This is how I think about it for myself, how I can stay in this, stay excited about it. So anyway, so thanks so much for being here. For those of you who are learning and interested in color, we've got a really cool, I've got a really cool thing called the Color Tips PDF. You can get it by going to colortipspdf.com. It's free and it goes over a bunch of some of the principles around color that I teach in all my workshops. And people have been emailing us back saying it's been really helpful. So we're kind of on a thing right now where we're talking about it a lot. So be sure to check out the links. I'm going to put some of the things I spoke about in the links. And there's also a place to leave some comments. And if you found this podcast helpful and cool, please share it with a friend or even better yet, leave a review. You guys, thanks so much for being here. Okay. Hey, thanks for listening to the Art to Life show. If you enjoyed the podcast, please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on Instagram at art to life underscore world. The recording of this and all episodes, along with a place to leave comments, see additional photos, and discover a whole new approach to making art, can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review and whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolivepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week.